Ed Harrison here for Real Vision. I am talking to Constantine Bomer of McKinsey Investments. He is the global fixed income portfolio manager there. Thanks for talking to us. Thank you, Ed. And you know, beforehand, I was telling you the reason that we're uh, talking is we're going to have uh, a pension week coming up going forward, where we're going to be talking about something uh, I think a lot of people are talking about as the retirement crisis. And I think this is a good place to start off the conversation. The concept of a retirement crisis. The question it begs the question: What? Why would anyone be thinking there's a, a crisis in retirement, and what do pensions have to do with that? I would uh, like to start probably with uh, the background: Why we started to look into this, and why this is such an important topic for us at McKenzie and for me personally. So I work in the asset management industry, and obviously there's a lot of interaction with uh, retirement because. What we have to do as asset managers is we have to provide financial security for also our clients. So that is a big part of why retirement is a key component here. But it's also that it is we have seen a massive growth in assets under management. And that is partly because so many pension funds have increased their assets, but also individuals had to start saving more and more for their individual security later in their life cycle. We now have the baby boomer generation, which was the dominant uh, generation in the uh, starting after World War II. That massive part of the of the population is now shifting towards retirement, and that is always those are crucial moments when a big part of the of the population is shifting from saving and starting to divest and starting to draw out money out of the system. So that, those are a lot of things which are making it extremely important for us. And for me personally, as a, as a fixed income manager, it is important for me because I like to look at data. I like to look at what is happening in financial markets. And I see that there are clear connections. And I've built over my life uh, multiple models to help me understand the world a little bit better. I've built models on uh, how to look at different countries, how credit worthy they are, also to look at ESG, to see which countries are well prepared, which countries are ill prepared. And that started also the process into building models, looking into countries, how well are countries prepared or how ill are they prepared. And to, to take it into next step, looking at US states or also US corporations to see how well is somebody prepared. And Very for, interesting. You know, uh, I'm, I'm excited to get into some of that data yeah. later on. And, you know, actually one of the things that I'm excited to think about is you mentioned before uh, off camera, you have, at uh, McKinsey Investments, uh, a, a, a model in terms of the way to think about it, a framing of four different things yeah. that uh, are relevant to thinking about this. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, the whole pension crisis, what we're doing here is we're looking at the whole industry or the whole, a whole country. So mm -hmm. it is a little bit unfair to overgeneralize a lot of those things. So there are phenomenal pension funds and countries which are extremely well prepared and individuals who are doing exactly the right thing. But what we do is we try to generalize in order to get a more broad view of what is actually going on. So the way that uh, we look at it is that there are four design flaws within mm -hmm. pension mm -hmm. funds in general. So right. And those four design flaws are demographics, then the underlying assumptions based on discount rate and uh, return expectations is a big design flaw. Then what we have in addition to that is uh, the vested interests. So who are the people who make the decisions? And fourthly, we have a conundrum where we have extremely high return expectations of those pension funds to hit their targets. And that is actually driving the asset allocation. Right. So it is not really possibly sometimes the best asset allocation that is possible in that moment. It is more that the return targets that a lot of pension funds have are driving the asset allocation. So yeah, let's go into that one sure. by one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the first design flaw, I think it's, it's pretty obvious. So uh, pension funds were developed um, a long time ago and really got uh, into prominence after World War II, and you saw a major pickup in corporations, but also local governments and, and federal governments. But during that time, we had vastly different demographics, right? right? Yeah. At those times, we actually had a, a pyramid where we had lots of workers and very little retirees. And the models at that time to determine a sustainable framework for the welfare state were based on the data that they had available at that time. 
and they built those models and came up with different kinds of features. And back in the days, um, in the 60s, people only had to account for roughly 13, 14 years of retirement. Mm -hmm. So when people, were, people worked up until their, they were 60s, in their 60s, and then you only had to finance on average 13, 14 years in the developed world. If we fast forward to today, yes, the average age or average retirement age has inched up a little bit, but the years in retirement have exploded. Let, let me guess, uh, 20. 20, it's roughly 20. That's yeah, right. that was pretty good. Uh, ex excellent, yeah. So it is, uh, that's a 50% increase right. from 13 and yeah. a half roughly to, to 20. For any financial model, it is extremely hard to adjust for such a major change because that means that at least they will need 50% more money based or relative to what their expectations were at the very beginning. And how do they get that more money? I mean, some of that probably goes into the other design flaws, but in general, from a demographic perspective, how do you deal with that? Like, what are the, the facets that uh, get you that more money? I mean, that's, that's the changes that uh, pension funds need to do. That is definitely raise the retirement age. Mm -hmm. Then there needs to be some kind of uh, increased contributions to adjust for the new reality. Right. And then there might also have to be a conversation on maybe the, the payouts, whether those assumptions or whether the plan that was originally uh, can come up with, if that's still relevant. Those are all not nice conversations to have. And that goes to the vested interest that is another design flaw where we say, look, nobody's really interested in uncovering all the mess that has been created and has basically festered over those years and only tiny little changes have happened. Right. The really big changes are still to be made. And what about, uh, I don't know if you go into this, but I would imagine, I mean, the first thing that came to mind when you talked about the demographics and you talked about savings to disinvesting, I thought immediately of spending and GDP changes. What sort of impact uh, does that uh, change in demographics have on the velocity of, uh, you know, the, the pace of GDP growth? Does it have any that you've, you've yeah. seen? I mean, I, I, in general, the, the super big picture for me would be that we have overspent because we had the security of the welfare state made people feel a lot more confident about the future mm -hmm. and about their increasing living standards that people were more willing to spend money. And now the realization phase is kicking in where that security and safety that we obtained since the 60s and 70s is being questioned. And that would probably mean that there will be less spending going forward and slightly right. slower growth. Because right. we also have a massive amount of unaccounted for debt. Debt levels are in general extremely high, but on top of that, we also have those uh, unaccounted debt levels coming from the, the pension funds. Right. So now what about the second part of uh, the design flaw? Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> so, um, so the, the second part are the financial assumptions. So right. It is, for any model that you build, it is okay to put in assumptions for stuff that you don't know or where you don't have a really good handle of what you put in, what your input factor is. But for a lot of those pension funds, and I would say the most prominent cases for that would be U.S. states. Mm -hmm. So that would be public pension funds, let's say the teachers, firefighters, police officers, and so on. So those... U.S. state pension funds, they have still ridiculous assumptions embedded in their calculations. And what we've done is we reverse engineered that whole formula to see, look, what, what is your assumption? What would be a realistic assumption? And the assumption that is still embedded and prevalent in U.S. states is that they think that they can discount future obligations at 7.1% and that their assets will grow every single year at 7.6%. Mm. And to put that into perspective, what does it mean to have a discount rate of 7.1%? Uh, that basically means if I had a obligation of $100, so I need to pay somebody $100 in 20 years time, it is basically enough if I have $25 right now in my pocket that would be considered fully funded. Right. So I don't need to have $100 right now, I just need to have $25 and I would be fully funded. Right. And I don't think that's fair. I don't think that is the right calculation. That is not the right assumption because 
let's say the time value of money should be significantly lower. Well, given the fact that interest rates are so low right now, yeah. it would and it, it, to the degree that that persists for a longer period of time, it would suggest that those discount rates are going to be lower and they're not going to be able to discount at that level of in perpetuity. Let's say you have like a 6% discount rate. Yeah. What happens to that 25 to 100 dollar? How does that change? Oh, it is dramatic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. Uh -huh. I mean, that discount factor has an oversized impact on the sustainability of a pension fund. So what we did in, uh, in our models is we said, look, why don't we just use 4%? Okay. I would say 4 is not even really fair because you want to give the impression that it is safe money. And because I want to give the impression that it's safe money, I think maybe a U.S. government uh, equivalent yield would be a fairly decent proxy, but let's just say we use 4%, which is significantly above what the uh, U.S. More than double. Exactly, yeah. So if we go to 4%, all of a sudden, uh, the, for the, just for the U.S. states alone, the deficit that the pension funds have would go from $1.3 trillion to $4.3 trillion. And that is a big difference. So that also means that the funding status, so right now pension funds are saying we have a funded status of, let's say, 74% or so. Mm -hmm. And if we use a discount rate of 4%, all of a sudden that sh switches to 47%. Right. So that is a dramatic difference in terms of how funded, how well able those pension funds are actually to meet, meet their future obligations. And the other side of that you said was the 7.6% uh, yeah. asset increase uh, yeah. assumption. Uh, we've already just said, you know, I looked at treasuries today, the 10-year was yielding 1.84s or thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, how do you get to 7.6% in that environment? Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, I'm a fixed income manager, so for me those numbers are completely uh, uh, out of reach. I mean, just to give you an idea what 7.6% would mean maybe in the sovereign bond space. So if you buy a Ukrainian bond, mm -hmm. a 20-year Ukrainian bond, you're not even getting to 7.6% yield. It is pretty aggressive. And of course, they have a very diversified portfolio and there are higher returning assets, let's say in the, probably in the private equity space and infrastructure, equities, of course, and, and other, uh, other assets, but still, achieving or trying to achieve and trying to hit 7.6% every single year is extremely ambitious because it doesn't account for market variability. Right. It doesn't account for that we're at record highs in almost any asset class, right? We're at record highs in equities, in fixed income, in uh, real assets. At some point, that's we'll, we'll have a few years where we don't hit those 7.6%. Uh, right. And you know, that gets back to the risk, and I'm, that's part four that you're going to talk about in a second, but what's the third uh, flaw that you've, uh, tell, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so the third one would be, let's say, vested interests. Right, here, I think of it as an like agency problem. Exactly, yeah. So here it is, just nobody wants to uncover what's really going on. Mm -hmm. it's, it's even, it hits the, the pensioners themselves. It's tricky to ask the difficult questions and to demand answers on is my pension sustainable because in a way it, like one sleeps better believing that one is safe than to ask and put all that effort into those probing questions and making sure that you get those right answers. But you know like uh, let me just say that let's say you're a U.S. state and you're underfunded by uh, 53 percent, th that's yep. the 47 percent that you said, versus 26 percent, then suddenly you're going to have to cough up a lot of money and from a budgetary perspective, that doesn't look good for you as someone who needs to be elected in you know a year or two years. It's a lot easier not to make that decision oh, absolutely. And, and let someone else make the decision you know, like five, 10 years yeah. later. Yeah, it's better to pretend because the real consequences of this would be for states to pony up a lot more money, right? right? And who wants to do that? Everyone wants to get reelected. Do you really want to, and you, you have two choices, right? You can either reduce expenditure or you can increase revenues. Taxes. Uh, taxes, right. And both of them are not really vote winners. No. So it is difficult to make that uh, decision now. It's better to just say, let's uh, let somebody else deal with it or let's just put some lipstick on it and uh, hope nobody will take another critical look at it.
Well, you know, the other option is to roll the dice. I mean, this goes to the fourth yep. uh, structural flaw. Perfect, yeah. You could move out the risk curve. You could move out uh, the uh, duration mm -hmm. uh, curve, mm -hmm. uh, which you could, uh, uh, you know, tilt your asset allocation. Tell me about that. Yeah, I think that's, that is what's going on. Pension funds have that uh, sticker target of we need to achieve a significant return on our assets, which is good. Like, yes, you, it is good to be ambitious. It is good to have certain goals that you want to hit. But if that is going to the extreme that it actually influences how you make your asset allocation decision, it might tilt you away from what is actually a sensible asset allocation to something that is overly aggressive. And I would put it into the context of all those pension funds are maturing. Right. right? It is just like us. When we're young, we should have a high tilt towards risky assets, towards also illiquid assets in order to gain that extra return, that extra liquidity premium, for example. So it makes sense in our early days of our personal career or personal lives to have a very high exposure to those higher potential assets. But as we progress, as we get older, of course, we need to adjust also how we're positioned because the sequencing of returns will become much more important, mm -hmm. right? It is, if you are in the payout phase for a pension fund, then you cannot really have drawdowns which are significant because that will really compromise your ability to pay back. If right. you have that drawdown early on in your career, there's a high chance that you will recover from that. Later on, it will be difficult, which is why a lot of pensioners will get the advice from financial advisors to reduce their risk and right. put more money in fixed income and cash and so on. Well, so now, given those uh, structural flaws that you talk about, yeah. I mean, you, you talked already about the general level not being enough. You started to drill down in three different ways. You've already done the data sets for uh, uh, countries. You've done the data sets for U.S. states, and you're in the process of doing the data set for corporates. Let's take those one by one and talk about places that are prepared and other places that are ill-prepared, and then also how you can invest against that. Yeah. Uh, let's look at country uh, risk first and foremost. Uh, what does your data set say on the country risk factor? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it's pretty broad and uh, it, is, uh, it covers, I think it's 43 different countries. We have seven major indicator, indicators and then 33 sub-indicators. Mm -hmm. So it is a big amount of data that we have there. And we generally get those information from publicly available sources, whether it's through Bloomberg or OECD or some other places where we collect that data. And then we try to make some educated guesses and educated decisions based on the analysis that we've done, the data that we see, and the outcome that, that, that we get. So what we have uh, right now is we have uh, the, the full data set. And the key indicators for us are, number one, demographics. I mean, mm -hmm. That is a crucial, crucial, crucial aspect where we see different demographics and demographic trends in the various countries that we look at. We look at government health, so how, let's say, how strong or how well-equipped a government is, and maybe the interesting features here would be debt to GDP or, or stuff like that, or if they have a sovereign wealth fund, the Saudi Arabias and the Norways, for example. We look at uh, government stress, and that is how big of a component, for example, is already or is your public sector as a total of your workforce. Mm -hmm. right? And here we see some Scandinavian countries which have very large public sectors, and then some other countries more in the emerging markets which only have a very small uh, public sector. We look at the health of the individuals, so that's not the, how actually how healthy they are, but how financially healthy they oh, are, right. uh -huh. which is more let's say GDP per capita or to see the, their assets and, and liabilities, so household debt uh, to income or other indicators. Then we look at um, whether those uh, pension funds are funded or in a pay-as-you-go structure. So here we have some countries like Netherlands, uh, Denmark and others, Canada also, who have a large portfolio of funded pension funds. And then you can see others, such as in many European nations, which are in a pay-as-you-go structure. So that is very, very different. And that includes Germany, is that right? 
That is correct, yeah. Right. yeah. Another one is that we look at mark-to-market risk, and that is a little bit of a controversial one, at least that's the, the one pushback that I've always gotten from my colleagues, mm-hmm. which is, it is great. So th- without a doubt, it is great to have a funded pension plan, but if that funded pension plan is, let's say, heavily invested in equities and they experience a significant drawdown, just that headline, front page of the newspaper, pension fund of the Netherlands lost 30%, that will have an impact on confidence, that will have an impact on how people feel. In Germany, this would not happen because there is nothing that they can lose, really. So that is, uh, let's say, a small ding on the extremely positive feature of having uh, funded pension plans. And then, of course, we need to look at the difference between what is promised and what is actually uh, what the pension fund or what the what the countries can deliver. And here it is, we look at what are, let's say, the, the median salary, what is the pension of as a percentage of that median salary. For some countries, it is very close to 100%, that mm-hmm. you get almost 100% of your of your salary, for other countries it is only 60%. And of course there will be massive differences in terms of your ability to fund a promise if you didn't promise that much. If you promise the world, of course it will be pretty hard to to, to satisfy that. You know, uh, I, I want to go into the relative health of the uh, of all these different countries, but as you were talking about uh, the promises, immediately I, I thought about Greece in particular, yeah. and I thought that this would be a good sort of test case to think about how these parameters are put into place, because one of the more important pieces of the IMF uh, uh, austerity package that Greece had to undergo involved uh, the pension uh, problem. Talk to me about where Greece, as an example, stands on some of these issues. Where is it that they have difficulties? Yeah. I mean, I don't know all the data by heart of, of my models, but it is Greece consistently consistently scores badly in, in all of those indicators. Um, so it is, it, of course, it is on the government health side, of course, they have debt levels which are extremely high. Right. We have a dip in uh, in the population health or financial health of their population, especially throughout the crisis. Then you have extreme obligations. Uh, you have a very bloated public sector. Right. And I would say reasonably generous promises, and they have been reduced. So that is one thing where we can see that Greece has improved in their ratings, but it is not to an extent where we say they solved their, their, their pension issues. But they have quite a few issues where you say, or where we see Greece actually scoring at the bottom of each of those indicators. And I would say in the overall ranking, and uh, we, can, we can also share this with, uh, with your viewers, is Greece is probably in the bottom three or four nations mm. globally. The other prominent And nation, that's even after the pension that's reform. That's right, yeah. I right. mean, with, with all of those models, I think it's also fair to say that they don't explain everything to the last bit of the detail because there's always a lagging effect, right? The, and the major lagging effect that is that occurs is that data for a lot of those international organizations only come out once a year. So we do see some minor improvements already, but it is that is where we take the qualitative part and the the quantitative part of the models where we just say, look, we know that they're working on it. We know that they're making improvements. So that is something that we can already adjust in our minds. The pure data is still a little bit lagging in this and it will probably catch up based on our qualitative assessment of what's going on in Greece. And, and, you know, mentally, as you say that, I immediately think back to Greece issuing a negative yielding bond uh, for the first time ever recently. So you have that dichotomy, and and that's really where the heart of uh, of where you're going. So can you tell me, uh, from a, uh, on a macro level, who are the best prepared and who are the least prepared countries and then, you know, perhaps uh, as a bolt-on later, we can talk about what does that mean in terms of how you invest against that. Yeah, sure. The best ones are like in Iceland is extremely good. Mm-hmm. In Netherlands is very good. We have South Korea is very good. And but for us, it is like one is the overall rate, uh, ranking, but mm-hmm. another one is always to see why do we get to those overall scores. 
And here we have to see what are, why is Iceland, let's say, top? And that appears, let's say, a little bit of a surprise. Mm -hmm. It was also right. a surprise to us where we say, then we, we have to drill in and say, what is, what, are, what, are, what is the reason why Iceland scores so well? And it basically comes down to them having made tough decisions in the 08 crisis. So they have made quite a few of a, quite a few adjustments during that time. And it's also that they don't promise so much. So the promises that they are giving out to their public employees are reasonably moderate based on how, let's say, uh, advanced the nation is. Because usually there's a high correlation to how advanced you are mm -hmm. to what you promise right. to, your, to your public employees. And they are undershooting on that score. Plus they are reasonably wealthy, let's say, as, as individuals and the government has cleaned up their act quite a bit. And that's a good juxtaposition to Greece in that in that case. Yeah, because both of them had crises. Uh, I, Iceland made the adjustments that you're talking about, and they didn't already have the pre-existing high promises that Greece had relative to their you know G, uh, per capita GDP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and those promises they always they usually they they just ramp up, right? right. They, during good times, you just it's easy to just promise a little bit more and to give in to demands in order to avoid whatever it is, a strike or uh, some trouble. I mean, we see now in France also how... Yes, Macron. Uh, exactly. I mean, he's doing exactly the right thing, right? He is pushing hard, in, in my mind, pushing hard for the right things, but the opposition is pushing back and is basically, as uh, it can easily happen with public sector employees, they basically are in control and in charge of a lot of really, really, really important parts of our society. So there is a very, very fine line of how much can you push, how much can you increase, let's say, the retirement age or increase contribution versus still making sure that you get all your essential services and, of course, treating your public se sector employees well, who are, in some cases, relative to the private sector, not uh, adequately um, uh, compensated. You know, where, where the rubber hits the road is where you talk about uh, the South Koreas, the Netherlands, and the Icelands of the world, and then how do you uh, play that from a macro perspective? Because number one, obviously, when you look at uh, how you would invest, say, on government bonds or any other uh, asset class, it's not just about what's happening with the pensions, but also, there is the you know relative factors like in terms of you know are they relatively the relative value of the assets that you're looking at so what's yeah. the um, what's the process that you use in terms of putting this into an investment management uh, component yeah one goal for us of course as investment managers has to be so what, right? So right, exactly. It's great that you do all of this work and that you maybe write a paper and uh, have this uh, fancy model, but what do we do with that? So I think for me, the one of the important pieces is that I want to educate. So I want to also show people, look, this is what's going on. Right. But at the same time, I am a, a paid employee, so I need to also make sure that whatever I do will have a positive impact on the tasks that I've been given. So for sure, we want to make investment decisions based on the information that we're getting. Mm -hmm. And I would say one is that it is an informational piece. So it is something where I'm not really saying you should have been invested like this yesterday, right? This is something that is, has a, a timeline or a horizon which is still some time out. But what is important for me as a macro investor is to also look out into the future, right? Everyone is focusing on the zero to three months, and we're also, of course, taking a look at it and making our decisions on a very short-term tactical basis. But it is, number one, it is highly competitive, and therefore there's a little bit less alpha in this space. There's more alpha if we look out further into the future, and that is a one-year, two-year, three-year time horizon, and we need to be game ready. We need to have our game plan of how we want to be invested if something happens, right. which we think there's a high, or there's a reasonably high chance that this will become center stage. And we can talk about what will be the triggers of to bring this center stage. But I think number one is we need to see, are there any glaringly obvious decisions that we need to make based on the model that we've seen and the qualitative analysis on the background. And I 
think the glaringly obvious decisions are that we look at Europe because that's it's always easier to make those decisions within the same currency. Right, well. yes. But if we look at Europe, there we have we have one central bank, but we have multiple different countries which are uh, actors in that in that environment. And then you have some like Netherlands which is extremely well prepared, and then you have others like Austria which is extremely badly prepared. Right. And then I look at those two bonds and as a bare minimum, I would say, let's not buy Austrian bonds because they trade at, uh, at the same level. And I think it's maybe eight basis points difference, but it's not worth the, 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 those extra eight basis points for going from one country which looks, let's say, stable and solid and well-prepared to something which on the, the, the surface looks decent but if you look under the surface, there are a lot of challenges. And I will put a massive disclaimer here that this is not investment advice that you should put on right. put on that spread trade right now. This is more going into the direction those kind of trades we would look at. And we also need to factor in, of course, what other pieces of information are there. Sure. Right. So we need to factor in that Austria just got a new... Uh, leadership and that is actually extremely progressive and might be the blueprint of how European politics will look in three, four, five years and maybe with that young dynamic tilted towards environmentally but still sustainable growth, maybe that is a framework which works extremely well for Austria. So we need to take all of those things into account. But if we were to just look at pensions, that is a pretty clear case to be long in Netherlands and, and short Austria. And can you play this in derivatives, you know, like CDS yeah. and things of that nature? Because I would imagine that when you look at the price of those derivatives, when you're looking for, you know, trigger events later on, when the trigger event happens, you know, yeah. the, the, that's, that protection uh, will, will crystallize to, towards the values that you're already predicting. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. I think that's, that's possible. So you could do those things. But I think what is maybe the more cost-effective way would mm -hmm. be to wait a little bit more until it hits the most critically exposed ones. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think having a good roadmap or a good game plan ready, it is, it is okay, I think, to miss the worst case if you then play the second tier. Right. right, because it will always trickle down. It will always be, there will be one country which will where it become center stage, let's say in Greece or in Italy or, or Spain or France, right, where you have a really big move based on what is going on in that country on the negative side. But then the second tier countries will not move for a very long time. So there will still, I think, be opportunity to put on those trades let's say, let it ride for a little bit longer, but at least it is right in front of you, the playbook. You can just pull it out and say, look, I'm game ready. Right. And that's one thing. I mean, the, the financial part is, is one thing. Another one is politics, right? Mm -hmm. So we, there it has already a huge impact, right? Where we see how maybe the political divide in countries is not based on ideology anymore. It is maybe a little bit more based on the intergenerational split between the older generations, the let's say the OK boomers and the millennials and under, where you see, well, who's actually going to pay for it? Is it the young through the contribution or is it the old or older through lower entitlements? Right. So, and I think that's what we see increasingly in, in a lot of places in Europe, but also globally, in a, definitely in other places too. So you have that financial aspect, you have that political aspect, and then you have let's say the really big structural impact of saying like, okay, how big is that problem in general? And how does that affect inflation rates going forward and GDP growth going forward? And there I just see a major drag from that particular aspect. That doesn't necessarily mean that I will be a permanent uh, bear on, on growth or on, uh, on equity markets, but it is one contributing factor which is extremely important for me. Let's use this as a transition point to think about U.S. states. Uh, a lot of our Real Vision viewers are U.S. based, and I think that the, you know the the framework that you laid out is pretty uh, solid in terms of thinking about the states. You know, when you talked about the obviously good uh, um, states, the obviously bad, but then there are the ones that are uh, you know not quite there. Talk to me about who, uh, who's in those tranches 
uh, and how you came to those, that determination. Yeah, so f I think for the US, it is a lot more interesting to put those spread trades on mm -hmm. because it's, mm -hmm. it's a very diverse pool. So I do have uh, lo lots of states in the US which are offering uh, uh, general obligations or other securities and you also have let's say not a super liquid, but you have some kind of CDS market on a lot of those right. things. And I think the, the basic logic, and again, that's not uh, investment advice, it's just the way that we would think about that issue, is that you disregard your, your Kentuckys, your Illinois, your New Jersey, so your the, the worst tier, right. where you know, everyone knows that they have issues. Right. There's no secret here. But what about the tier right below that? Like what about the, the Mississippi or uh, Nevada or some other places where you, you say, look, nobody has talked about them. But so what are the, the uh, what are the states that no one's talked about that I would be surprised to know is the second uh, tier below, uh, you know, New Jersey and Illinois. Yeah, I mean it's it's exactly those. It's the Mississippi. Definitely, we have. Uh, Connecticut would probably be the first tier. New York would probably also be the first tier. It is, let's say, a lot of states which are which do not have natural resources. So those would be generally the top tiers. Mm -hmm. And extremely populous countries uh, with a lot of with a high uh, high population are, let's say, oftentimes a little bit more challenged. Uh, Texas being uh, an, an exception here, given their the oil wealth. But it's like middle to smaller states around it, the fringes which are like oftentimes overlooked in in many ways so it's oftentimes the flyover states uh, which are not at the at the coast so those are oftentimes uh, let's say a, a little bit more challenged um. and you mentioned Nevada that, so they would be a second tier potentially on, on the on the bad side, right? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and what? Where are the obvious choices on the other side of that in terms of well funded? And how does that play into when you think about a a relative value or a CDS play for yeah. that? Yeah. I mean, the obvious ones. I mean, for me, would be like a District of Columbia or Utah is mm -hmm. like extremely stable and and good country. Wisconsin, which is also pretty good. So you have some which are super strong, mm -hmm. and then you have, as I mentioned, some which are really bad and in the news, and then the medium to bad, those are ones where I think it would make sense in general to buy some CDS protection. So it would, like a logical trade for me, would be that you're long certain high quality states, let's say, I mean, you can, Idaho is, is, a, is a good one, Utah, great. Tennessee is also pretty decent. So you can buy, let's say, some assets in those states, let's say GOs, general obligations, mm -hmm. and then you simultaneously you purchase some credit default swaps on the medium to, to lower tier. And those would be the Mississippi, let's say, and Nevada. Right. And you roughly pay the same. So the spread that you gain is roughly the spread that you pay because it is not obvious. Right. Right. Because the market is treating them all the same. It is only treating the bad ones differently. But right. everyone else is being treated the same. So a CDS on a Nevada is maybe 36 basis points and a CDS on a Utah is maybe 33. So three basis point difference, that's not a, that's not a big deal. So you can buy those uh, general obligations, you buy the CDS, and you're left basically with a package which is the US Treasury. So it is the, the underlying duration component because you, the spread that you gain or the credit that you gain, you pay it away. So net net, you're at a US Treasury uh, yield, but the return profile in the crisis will be dramatically different. Because if we go into that crisis, you would see those spreads massively changing where you see the second tier of worse adjusting up right. to the to the worst and the best ones just staying roughly where they are and what about leverage and duration in terms of plays of that nature i mean that depends on what abilities everyone has to to access leverage it would make or it would appear to be a natural play to use some kind of leverage because it's very small uh, differences in uh, in spread. 
So it would make natural sense, but everyone has to see how that fits in their own profile. And I mean, for, for the funds that I manage, we wouldn't be able to access leverage, or at least for the majority of our funds. For some, we could, but that's something that uh, everyone needs to look right. at themselves. And, and duration, like what sort of time frame are you looking at? Yeah, so I think there's, again, this is not a trade that you had to put on yesterday, which is great. So I always like, uh, or I dislike, when somebody says, I've been right for years and now we're getting to the last little bit and I still believe in it, but I've already made so much money in the past. And uh, so this is, you're at the very, very, very early stage right. of putting on a trade. So you have not missed anything. You have not lost anything, but you have not missed anything. You work with feedback loops and you work with non-linearity where you say, this is actually not moving until it completely moves. Right. So this yes. is something where, and I also like those investment ideas in general where you have very little movement and then you have a massive event which restates and, and makes uh, for outsized gains in, in that case. And that's why the funding structure that you're talking about makes a lot of sense because it's fairly stable over a longer period of time, but very yeah. small, but then it adjusts. Yeah. And I think in terms of timing, I mean, what I would look at is, mm -hmm. is it's, it's actually just equity performance. Because the sequencing, what I mentioned earlier, the sequencing of returns is becoming center stage. Because a lot of pension funds have matured, so they don't have the capacity to have a bad year, maybe, but two bad years would be really, really difficult. And once you get a couple of bad years, and a bad year is not minus 10 or minus 20, a bad year is, but your baseline is 7.6%. So right, a yeah. bad year is already zero. So let alone minus something. So a couple of bad years will make everyone look at those pension funds again. And they will say, oh, look, what does it mean if you have, if you underperformed, if you're, performance was so bad for a couple of years, what does that mean? And then I think there's also this uh, reinforcing feedback loop where you had possibly a bad year or two bad years, but then what do you do? Well, as a pension fund manager, you have your, your pool of money and you see your target slipping away. You have two choices, either you go for the Hail Mary, right. or you say, look, I'm gonna protect what I have so that I at least have something reasonably to pay back. And I would say that most will take the latter option of saying, look, we had too much risk on the book. The market called us. We are swimming naked and we have to make those adjustments and then sell even more in an already declining market. Very interesting. Uh, any last thoughts on like how to uh, think about this entire uh, this entire retirement crisis, because as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, you know, in a down market, a sustained bear market of 20% or more, when you say that 0% is already, when you have a 7% assumption, are gonna be difficult. That's, that's a difficult uh, thing to, for these companies or these, these countries to, uh, and, and states to deal with. Yeah, I mean, my, my few thoughts would be, policymakers do know that this is broadly going on. So there is, I think, an increasing and large incentive of policymakers to not make it happen. So for not, mm, for mm. to see that there is an implicit put in the equity market, because that would be a much uh, lesser evil to deal with. A Fed put, basically. A Fed put or even a government put, right? right. It could be, could, could come from either the monetary side or from the fiscal side. But I think there is a put because the consequences will be uh, pretty dire. So I think there is an underlying put and we need to take that into account. While I'll see all the doomsday scenario, I also have to recognize that there are players who are extremely powerful and who can move the needle and can move the market. So I think that's, that's a, an extremely critical aspect. I think another one is that we need to see what would a scenario be of somebody bailing out those uh, institutions. So let's say if that put were not to work with conventional policies, mm -hmm. like what is the next step? So what, 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 what will happen if 
one major pension plan, another one, a third one, all go bust. What will happen? Who will step in? But here I think that we will, it has to get, like for the easy puts that are in place from the fiscal and from the, from the monetary side, if that doesn't work and we actually see some defaults, uh, some more defaults, then what will the consequence be? And I think that here the path will be that the federal government will have to step in because it's too critical, too crucial of a uh, component of society that they can just let it go and say, okay, you, California, you deal with your own mess and New York, you deal with yours and Wisconsin, you deal with yours. So I think there will be a federal bailout eventually going to happen, but it is something that probably needs to get a lot worse before it can get better. Very interesting conversation. Thank you, Constantine. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, Ed.